given to me by Woody Shaw, Sonship, Dizzy, and John Kahn, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my music heroes. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome everybody inside the Blackwood Broadcasting Studios at an undisclosed institute of higher learning. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're happy you could all join us today. So many now make up their own history. The economic, political, and spiritual essence of this nation has been askew for quite some time. I don't cry for no hipster. Why should I? This go-it-alone approach has not fostered but hindered the ability of bands to form a nucleus. A hard, crusty nucleus like my guest today had with Clyde Stubblefield and Phil Upchurch. Or before that with the Ardells, which was comprised of himself, Boz Skaggs, and Steve Miller. I am not a hipster. I seek knowledge from those who were able to document the rhythms created during diaspora by primary source. The origins of the awkwardness, gentrification, racism, and bigotry that still casts its ugly head in overt and covert ways. When Skaggs and Miller went to West Berlin, my guest decided to finish his degree and pursue a doctorate at Sussex in England. The regional music of the Midwest, from Chicago to Detroit to Milwaukee, A.B. Sky, the ability to uproot and relocate to a houseboat and the sole turnaround of Blue Mitchell. My guest has had a prolific career as a lead pianist and singer on his own records, found his way into Blue Thumb, and recorded with legendary drummer Tony Williams. But the bum's rush came along, so my guest had to reinvent himself, promoting the magic of writing books like Black Talk, performing for changing audiences as the urban grit disappeared and took the inner city funky blues with it. Quoting my guest, the musician is the document. He is the information himself. The impact of stored information is transmitted, not through records or archives, but through the human response to life. Putting in time on planet Earth, Ben Sidron, welcome to The Jake Feinberg Show. Down with your bad self, Jake Feinberg. <laughs> great to be here, man. Yeah, man. It's so great to talk to you. I mean, it's, uh, I, um, my, my engineer last week was like, you know, what about Ben Sidron? I was like, you know, I, I mean, he's been on my radar for a while. And then, you know, you, you, you hopped onto Twitter and I'm like, well, it's just meant to be. So it's, it's great to have you, man. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. You know, I, I really want to ask you, um, about when you were, uh, did you grow up in, in, in Racine, is that right, in Wisconsin? I did. And, and I did. Uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say I was born in Chicago, but I grew up in Racine. And, and so Milwaukee was the biggest city closest to you guys? We're kind of, yeah, it was, but we're kind of halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago, but a little closer to Milwaukee. And and I wanted to talk to you specifically, my, my first question was, you know, when you first became aware of the blues circuit in and around uh, Wisconsin and how the fact that the Hammond B3 was cur- was coming out of the church and and into the nightclub and 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 the kind of sounds you were hearing uh, growing up. Well, the Hammond B3, the first time I heard it uh, was on a Jimmy Smith record in the fifties. Um, when uh, I was growing up in Racine, that would have been my only access to any of these sounds at all. I mean, it's a small Wisconsin town, or it was then. And uh, kind of idyllic in the sense that in the 50s, it was just your classic Midwest little town. Um, When I came to Madison, Wisconsin, when I was 17 years old, uh, that's when I ran into Steve and Boz and the Ardells. And I started listening to, you know, the Texas Shuffles, Jimmy Reed and T-Bone Walker. And there was a cat here, uh, because I'm still in Madison, who had a little blues club. And uh, the 
name of the club was the Tuxedo Lounge, and there was a B3 organ in there. Mm-hmm. And he was a really good guitar player, and uh, he hired me to play in this club with him uh, six nights a week, three sets a night for six weeks. And I had to play a Hammond organ, and so that's how I learned how to play Hammond organ. Wow. On, wow. on the gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, that's, and that's because uh, we have a lot in common. I, I must tell you, the first, I found this album on Capitol from 71 uh, that you did. It's you and this woman on the cover. And yep. uh, and uh, and then on the back, I'm reading, and it's like they're promoting this book that you wrote. And I was like, it was called Black Talk. And mm-hmm. I said, holy cow, this guy is deep, 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 deep. You know, I mean, beyond just the, beyond the music. So I, I say to myself, you know, th- there was a linkage between uh, your generation of players, guys like you and Boz and, and Steve, who were able to really have access and, and learn on the bandstand with those first generation blues guys. And I wanted you to talk to younger generations, uh, guys, because we've lost a couple generations with the uh, the digital age here. Talk about the leadership qualities of, of this guy at the Tuxedo Lounge or any of the other first generation blues guys that really had an impact on you. Well, that's absolutely right. Uh, the leadership qualities uh, were profound and not something that uh, you actually recognized as it was going down. For example, um, your job when you're up there on the stage, the great drummer Art Blakey once said, your job is to help those people wash away the dust of everyday life. And I remember at the Tuxedo Lounge, my job was to groove those people uh, into a place where their everyday worries uh, were lessened. So when they went out the door, they felt better than they did when they came in the door. And it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter if you're playing blues or swing or if you're singing about My Baby Left Me or if you're singing about, you know, Let the Good Times Roll. Your job up there is to channel the feeling and get the room to come together in that moment where everybody feels something together and then they know they're not alone anymore. Hmm. And this fe- this feeling of being part of something bigger than yourself is what the music's always been about. And it's not really about, I mean, it's great to earn some money, and it's uh, great to get out of the ghetto, and it's a lot of things are great. But the music itself has always been about this kind of uh, spiritual activity, so that if you go back far enough, I mean, if you go back hundreds of years into the African diaspora, what you find is musicians we're also magicians and doctors. So we really are talking about some core uh, essential element of the human experience here. It's beautiful said. I mean, I, I spoke to uh, Baba Ken Okololu, who was a was bass player in, for Fela Kuti in, in Africa, and he talked about his dad. I don't know if he was a musician, but he was a miracle worker, I mean, a doctor as well. I mean, I have to, t- I have to tell you, um, you know, my, uh, you know, I was born in, in 78, so I'm a veritable youngster. But, I mean, I really go back and love talking to guys like Big Black and other people like that who have their own views of terminology, and but also going back to, to Congo Square. And I, I'm curious if I could ask you about your research in that uh, when you were, not to jump too far ahead, but when you went to England or maybe even before that, and you wrote your book, before you wrote your book, who were some of the primary source people that you talked to about uh, uh, diaspora? Well, of course, Congo Square is, you're you're talking about the turn of the century, and uh, I never met anybody who was at Congo Square when (laughs) it was happening in New Orleans, you know. uh, That specific information would have been from, uh, you know, uh, the scant literature that existed at that time, you know, there were a few books around that talked about it. And you can find, I mean, if you go to Black Talk uh, in the back, there's uh, a list of, of, of books that I was reading at the time. But what I was really doing when I was writing that book, and I guess, you know, in its simplest form, that book is about the transformative effect in a Western civilization of the African-American uh, impulse toward spontaneity, toward uh, 
uh, a certain kind of truth telling, and um, the fact that the music of Black America, essentially, particularly during the '60s, now I would not make the same case, uh, was invisible to most of white America, and so it was able to operate on the kids seamlessly and without opposition. So, uh, having said that, getting back to Congo Square, the thing about Congo Square is that was a place in New Orleans where ex-slaves would congregate and play music, and uh, mostly drum music. And eventually, uh, it was outlawed because the drums were used to communicate. They were afraid of revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought that the drums were beating out like a Morris code, like a a primitive cymbal system. And Mm -hmm. they were, you know... Uh, which is the way a Western mind would think. But the fact is, drums are used to talk. When they talk about talking drums, they're not beating out A, B, C, D, E. They're beating out words and things. I mean, it's the story can be told in many ways. For example, the story of a particular tribe in Ghana uh, can be passed along on drums. Uh, the drums can tell the history of a people. So this idea that there's not just um, music in the words, but there's words in the music, right? I mean, everybody knows a good set of lyrics is musical. But how about a good melody? What if a good melody is literal? What if a good melody tells a story? And that's something I've been thinking about nonstop for 50 or 60 years. The latest book I I wrote uh, was called There's a Fire, Jews, music, and American dream is based on the idea that these that melodies and harmonies can contain meaning, and uh, because we don't see them or think of them that way, they pass almost unnoticed, but they totally direct our lives. So, as you can see, um, my mind works on, on on these levels all the time. This is just what's going on in my head. (laughs) That this is that what's so unbelievable is that I it, it's what's going on in my head as well, and you were able to articulate this idea of because especially during the time when you were really sort of just becoming a leader, and you know Blue Mitchell was on your albums. But when I think of Blue Mitchell as a perfect example, the melodies in his solos they tell stories. I I feel those stories. I wasn't even around for those stories, but there's a visceral. There's an you know what it's called. It's to me, it's an urgency. There was an urgency to the music, and it must have reflected at the time, you know, ha- their struggles, their struggles at that time, and the way they always did uh, before that as well. But I just Blue Mitchell was the perfect c- example because he's a guy. They played what they felt, and I, I was writing something down when you said you said um, African American. Art, music, was an expression of spontaneity and truth-telling. So let's break that down. First start with the spontaneity, please. Well, spontaneity, in the sense, is you're not so much uh, taking what you're doing and uh, recapitulating or uh, using it as a secondary source, but you're observing it as it's happening, just as the listener is. I'm hearing what I'm playing just when you're hearing what I'm playing. So you turn yourself into a, a vessel, a conduit, and you channel. Everybody said that's what it is. Coltrane said it. Everybody says that's what you're doing. Uh, the music doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't start or end with me or you or anybody. It exists, and, and, and we uh, call it down in, in, in the classic gospel sense. We're calling the spirit into the room. That's spontaneity. Um, when I hear Blue Mitchell, I understand exactly what you're saying, because when I was 13 years old listening to those Horace Silver records, <laughs> I thought I could literally parse, understand what he was playing in, in language, because it seemed so literal. It seemed like he was telling me something, and if I just heard it one more time, I would understand it. So I would listen to it hundreds and hundreds of times, the same song, the same solo, just on the verge of understanding it. <laughs> well... It turns out, I think, Mm. that what was so profound that I was feeling, I mean, it wasn't crazy, um, is that it's not a a literal parse of what he's feeling. It's not about, man, I went into the store and I couldn't get any credit and I dropped my money down the sewer. It's not like that. What it is, 
is it's an immediate expression of caring, of, of caring about something or somebody, and you feel th- this idea of caring, or you feel this idea of passion, or you feel this, you feel this warm heart beating on the other side of the of the fence. So it's not so much literally telling the news of your life, although in a way it is, because how you feel is directly connected to what you go through. But uh, mm. it's deceptive because when we start out, we think, ah, there's a secret in here that I can un- untangle. But the fact is there are no secrets. There's no secret in there. Everybody hears the same thing. And if you open up your ears and listen, you will get the story. <laughs> there's nothing you don't know. There, there's no uh, syntax that you have to learn in order to get the story. I, I say, um, well, then, yeah, I just, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm feeling great because I know I'm not crazy either, you know, at this point. Because, yeah. I, I, I mean, we've lost uh, so many of these titans. I, I have to go back to Madison uh, with Boz and Steve, um, you guys were able to, the accessibility to these guys were also, was also incredible. Uh, there were no entourages, there were no limousines, there was no, uh, multi, you know, million dollar, uh, engagements. I mean, you guys could, they'd be more apt to play at, uh, at, uh, you know, after hours coffee houses and maybe even strip clubs. And yet you guys could go and even sit in with them and I just think that that the I think it's called experiential learning. In in, in what I'm in one of the chapters of the book that I'm writing, it's it, it's about experiential learning. Your generation had that. You had the ability to go and play with these titans and walk out of there and say, you know, there are no secrets. What you're saying is true, but in to, it, with younger generations now, not as lacking the experiential learning, especially when it comes to music, lacking that that visceral feel. Uh, people bl- people get paranoid, and I just think that that is uh, what you were doing at 13 years old is is really quite astounding, really amazing. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, today, neuroscience is a is a big uh, big field. Everybody's doing functional MRI scans to find out the emotional roots of of memory and thought and all this sort of thing. But there's two kinds of memory. One is called episodic memory, which is sort of remembering I went to the store, I bought something, I came home. The other is emotional memory, where it's not episodic. And you remember uh, kind of, it, it becomes uh, synesthesia, you know, where it feels colors and it, 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 sings, uh, it, it, it sings food. And it, it, it's this kind of soup that we live in, the emotional soup that we live in. And episodic memory is invariably inaccurate. We all, every time we, we remember something, we change it just a little bit. So once you've had a memory that you've dredged up a few times, the truth is, is pretty far gone. But emotional memory is invariably accurate. And, in, and emotional memory continues to inform who you are as a person. And you're absolutely right about those experiences. And what was so powerful, I mean, I remember sitting uh, in a military base once, uh, outside of Chicago, I had gone to play a gig at this military base, and there was some cat who I have no idea who he was to this day. But he was uh, uh, a soldier. He was uh, probably in his early twenties, black uh, piano player, sitting at an old upright piano playing. And I went up to him and I started talking to him. And you know, if I tried to remember the literal conversation, the episodic memory. I would invariably be make, making every word up. But the emotional memory is absolutely accurate. I sat with him, and after about an hour, I understood that we were related, that we were brothers, uh, that it was something that I needed to pursue, that there was something profound going on, and it was so simple and so uh, seductive mm-hmm. that it would, be to, it would be what I was going to do the rest of my life. There's just no question about it. You know, it's just, I, I'm, I'm trying to contain my excitement. Happy New Year, by the way. I wanted to, Thank you. Yeah. Happy New Year to you. I, I, uh, I want to just play a track of music and, and calm down, and then we'll come back and, and go through it, okay? Go ahead.
All right. You want to take a guess what that is? I can tell you exactly what that is. <laughs> That's me and Curly Cook and Phil Upchurch and Clyde Stubblefield 40 years ago in a in a small room playing a groove that Phil Upchurch wrote. I'm on a Wurlitzer piano and off we went. Oh, that's you know I think I don't I don't see Curly on this particular track, which by the way is blowing my mind that Curly Cook, but it, it's you and Upchurch and Stubblefield at and uh, this was made at a Full Compass Sound in Madison, Wisconsin, off the album "I Lead a Life," Slippery Hip. Um, yeah. You know, and and you brought up this uh, this anonymous Army Cat, twenty year old guy, but I couldn't help but think one of the earliest supporters of the Jake Feinberg show. Uh, was Phil Upchurch. I mean, and Chicago, I mean, he, he went up there and he was, he remembers, he talks about going down to Market Street and seeing these blind Dobro players and playing with, yep. the, with, the, with the tin cans. And and I'm like, you know, we're all, Sidron, you're right, we're all brothers. And it's hard for people to say that these days because things have gotten, barriers have gone up in music and live venues have been cut down. And quite honestly, we're, we may be, there's a variety of factors, but please uh, talk a little bit about um, the how you even got involved uh, with the ability to get a rhythm section like Clyde and, and Phil. Well, going back to the idea of, of, of brothers, you know, it's literally, uh, it's, it's a literal truth. And until somebody grasps just how literal it is, you, you, you can just uh, talk yourself into circles. But the fact is, if you go back... Uh, you know, it's not that long, 20,000 years, 30,000 years, I don't know exactly how long. We literally all come from the same mother in the uh, in the African diaspora. So that, I mean, literally they have traced the genetic evidence back to the fact that we are related. And so that, to me, I mean, racism is uh, simply impossible because there is only one race. There's the human race. Everything else I think of as local color, you know. it's it's We're literally related. So that's the first thing. The right. second thing. Uh, a rhythm section like Clyde Stubblefield and Phil Upchurch is a, is a gift from above, man. I mean, uh, quite quite seriously. I, I met Phil Upchurch in 1972 in uh, Los Angeles in a recording studio. I was just there with a friend of mine who was uh, working on Phil's record. And uh, I hadn't known him. Of course, I knew all, uh, about him uh, from his time in Chicago in the 60s. And uh, he was, you know, at that point, he was very uh, prolific and famous uh, among musicians. And by the end of the afternoon, he he had asked me to play on one of the songs on the record, and I and I recorded with him. And uh, he was living in Chicago, and I was living in Madison. So we became partners in crime. You know, we started playing a lot of gigs in Chicago, hanging out. And at the same time, just by coincidence. James Brown's band came through Madison, Wisconsin, and his drummer, Clyde Stubblefield, got into a fight with him, and Clyde's brother lived in Madison, right. so he quit the band right here in Madison, <laughs> and he walked into a gig I was playing. You know, I always play little little clubs around town, man. I still do, just because it's such an important part of uh, Absolutely. Who, who, who I am, I guess. Mm -hmm. But in walked Clyde Stubblefield. So what do you do when James... Brown's drummer walks into the club and you're hanging out with uh, the staple singer's bass player, <laughs> which is what Phil Upchurch was. Absolutely. That's a rhythm section, man. I mean, you stop and, and, uh, and roll tape. <laughs> I mean, at that point, it was, a, a, it was a sign from above, but you were really, I mean, I, this to me is like uh, it's the special stuff because, um, like you said, it, it, it came across completely organically. The thing is, I also yeah. look back at that time and I say to myself, you know, Chicago was a perfect example of a place where there were, you know, you could go to uh, an uh, intersection and there were four clubs on four different corners. And maybe, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, Coleman Hawkins or, or somebody would be playing in one place. And there's a whole variety of things. But, I mean, Phil talked about, you know, what it was like to be a musician. He might play a jingle in the morning. He might do a game show. He might do a commercial. And then he'd play in the nightclubs. And um, you guys really had a formidable uh, a formidable group. The, the, the one, I, I don't have the track with me, but it, the tell me a little bit about the meaning of, this, of the album title, Putting in Time on Planet Earth. Oh, huh. you know, uh, it, it's kind of related to what we're talking about in that there was a time in the late 60s uh, and the very early 70s when we were all, and when I say we, I mean musicians, were all talking about um, 
not the politics of the music, but the transformative nature and how we were living in a way that had never been possible before. There was this thing among blacks and whites and young and old, man. It, it, it seemed like all barriers for a moment had come down. And it was all about the groove, and it was all about how it felt. And, you know, if you if you played with somebody, it was all about the music. And, and so a lot of stuff was coming together. I mean, I remember thinking back then, hearing Pharaoh Sanders for the first time, that I would love to hear Pharaoh Sanders with uh, James Brown, that, that that was a natural coming together of very similar elements. So, uh, you know, years later, it was possible to do that. But at the time, it, it, it you know, the record business was still trying to find singer-songwriters. So it was a very confusing time in a way, because remember that in the early 70s, rock and roll had killed the jazz clubs. Right. There weren't many jazz clubs specifically. And it was a, it was a strange strange time because the record business was just starting out to do something that uh i mean retrospect was um you know it, it was inevitable and it was driven by this new technology you know of recording multi track but when i started out all that music you're talking about it was captured that music existed out in the world phil upchurch was playing that stuff in the club, and then he'd go play it in the studio. Mm -hmm. It was man it, it, it was captured, and then by seventy three, seventy four, and when disco started and all this other stuff, that was manufactured music. That's a sign that the business had matured to the point where they started turning out music that didn't exist in the world, that could never exist in the world, and shipping it into the world. And that little fulcrum, uh, which was driven by technology, it was driven by the marketplace, it was driven. Uh, by all the forces in play, political, social, cultural, whatever, was was a very, very meaningful moment that I think, just like the other moments we've been talking about, nobody recognized because it was invisible. It just seemed to happen naturally. But that's what the big difference was. Uh, music became something that wasn't just part of our lives. It became something that could be monetized and something that could be translated into units. And it could be... Uh, you know, uh, used uh, to get, the units could be used uh, to justify playing a gig as opposed to playing the gig. So um, no, I think it's I, I just it's um there's just I'm curious. Just what, were you part of AB Sky? No, AB Sky was uh, Tim Davis and Curly Cook and. I wonder if Jim Peterman might have been the keyboard player. I'm not sure, but it was a, a band. Well, Howard band. Wales was on there for a while. The, he was an organ player, but I, I thought it's, it gave you credit. I guess you know. Here's I played on no. I played on their records. Sure, I played on their records. But AB Sky originally, you probably don't even go back this far because there was no evidence of it. It was a band in Madison. Right. When I was playing in the Ardells, AB Sky was a band here in Madison, and they went out to San Francisco, and that's when Howard Wales became their organ player. And so when I would go out to San Francisco. I would hang with the guys and play on the records. Oh, uh, what a so you got the chance to, and was Tom Donlinger the the drummers were they involved with it too? Uh they well might have been yeah. because uh I I was really familiar with the the, the people with uh with Madison Roots and Tom wasn't so. I I wanted uh I wanted to uh ask you about when you went out to San Francisco with with and to visit or to hang with those guys. Can you paint a picture? Because regionalism is another chapter of my book. You have these regional pockets of mu music, whether it was Woodstock or like Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee in the South. San Francisco, the Bay Area, there was a lot of jazz guys. I talked to George Duke about this uh, before he passed on. You know, it was the idea that a lot of East Coast jazzers were coming to the West Coast and settling, and it really settled the scene out there. And that was kind of around the time that you guys went out there T tell me tell me about that experience eyes wide open kind of walking into a regional scene before we were all interconnected and how you grew as a person and, and as a player well i first went to san francisco in 1964 uh i dropped out of college i think i was just in the middle of a sophomore or junior year i was you know going for a semester dropping out playing music chasing women and a girlfriend of mine uh had a had a driveaway car and was going west and I just jumped in the car with her and a couple other people, drove to San Francisco, uh, crashed at, at uh, a friend of mine 
uh, at his apartment. It was on Haight Street, but it was way before. Haight Street was just a little Italian neighborhood. It wasn't the famous Haight-Ashbury sure. that it became. Sure. And there was a coffee house down the street called the Blue Unicorn, and um, there was a club that just opened up on Fillmore called the Both And, which was a jazz club. And uh, it was, I would go down to the City Lights bookstore, and, and I would see Ferlinghetti there, and I would kind of sit around and, and hope to uh, absorb something. I didn't know what. Um, it was uh, very small, very much a bohemian scene. Then when I came back in 67, because Steve and these cats were playing at the Matrix and, and the Fillmore, it was a totally, totally different scene. It had been invaded from uh, all other parts of the country. Uh, there were thousands, it seemed, uh, thousands of people, of course, many from the Bay Area, but many from all over. Uh, the Fillmore, for example, uh, you know, was driven in some sense by the Chicago blues scene, by Butterfield and Bloomfield and the cats who came out there. Uh, and so uh, this uh, idea that you're talking about regional music, mm. uh, that's kind of the moment where it came apart, 67, 68, 69. Uh, it up came until apart. Then, it came apart. That's unbelievable. Continue to keep talking. About yeah, it. yeah, well, well, before that, there was a Chicago way of doing things. You know, you'd go to Chicago and you'd go to the clubs and there was a particular shuffle. There was a feeling. For example, Tim Davis, the drummer with the Steve Miller band, was a great shuffle drummer. And the feeling of his shuffle was definitely a Midwest feeling. I mean, if you had played with cats from around the country and you played with Tim, you'd recognize immediately that he came from the upper Midwest. And there's just a feeling that, that cats have here. There's a feeling in the rhythm section in this uh, in the middle of the country that's uh, a signature. Back in the 30s, you could have said the same thing about Kansas City and Basie's band or whatever, or you could have said the same thing about Texas and the Texas shuffle. Uh, you know, that's regionalism. Right. That's regionalism. Right. Where you could, right? But by the time it got to San Francisco, you know, San Francisco was a free-for-all. I, I don't think a lot of people realize what it was like, but you know when the Grateful Dead started, only half of those cats were actual musicians. Uh, you know, uh, other bands, there was... Uh, uh, a bunch of groups out there that were put together by people who, you know, in 67, 68, 69, people were dropping a lot of acid and listening to Coltrane and Pharaoh Sanders and Ornette Coleman <laughs> right. and thinking, well, I can make those sounds on a horn, too, and picking them up and screaming and carrying on and uh, <laughs> playing, you know, it was at the start of punk music where it wasn't supposed to sound good. It was supposed to sound like you didn't know what you were doing. So it was chaos. And San Francisco at that point was chaos. Uh, it was good, it was bad, it was ugly, it was indifferent, it was fantastic, it was everything at once. It was a gymnasium full of stoned people uh, listening uh, to the sounds bouncing off the walls, echoing the sound in the film was terrible. It was like your high school gym with a couple of uh, stacks of martial amps and, and light projecting on the back wall mm -hmm. and every kind of everything going on in every corner. And um, it was a form of, uh, of madness, and uh, it, worked, it worked its magic. But at the same time, it was really not about music so much as it was experiential, and music was just there driving it. Okay, so that's that's really interesting. That's fantastic. I, I guess my point is like what I, what I fantasize about is this idea that around the time of World War II, uh, there was a lot of, uh, because of the war and the Pacific dock was out by Marin, so there was a lot of families, a lot of black families from Arkansas and the Texas area. They would migrate out to, to the Bay Area because there was work. And then all of a sudden, those cats grew up, and they were playing in the Fillmore District with Merle Saunders. Maybe it was Calvin Keyes, or it could have been anybody else, but there were these, these gut bucket jazzers. There was a place called the Happy House where people would just stay for weeks at a time. Um, the Booker team. All true, all true, and it was great. In '64, when I went there, uh, I saw Monk play in a little local place. I mean, there, it was that what you're saying existed, but it got blown up in 1967. It got blown I mean, up in. You're, you're, okay, so the thesis of my, I mean, because I was what I was looking at was saying, okay, when when Mill when Miller and Skaggs and Sidron were were testing the waters, it was kind of 
that's when every, the, the melting pot started to come about. It was so new that it was so beautiful. Now it seems it seems like post-75 is when it just blew apart. But that, that late 60s, early 70s seems like that's when – that's when it wasn't out of the realm of possibility to, to – Cal Jader was two weeks at the both end. Big Black was at the both end. Eddie Henderson could be a psychiatrist and play music. I mean, it doesn't – it just doesn't even seem real now. And no. it's just unbelievable. that you, And you're blessed to have lived through it, man. I mean, that's – and that's what I'm really trying to get at is saying – I think what you said before was profound. It's about people – making music that exists that's real as opposed to making manufactured music that's not real i mean just you just nailed it right there i don't i don't right. and, and, and 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 you realize though that those gut bucket clubs even the both end which was you know it had a light box on the wall so it was kind of uh, psychedelic but those uh, attracted you know hipsters they attracted uh, bohemians they attracted you know black folks out for a tuesday night the, the kids who passed out in the Fillmore had nothing to do with that. They wouldn't under they wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't listen to that. Likewise, the people who went to those clubs wouldn't go to the Fillmore. So the the young white middle class experience, starting in '67 and going through '72, uh, was a bizarre offshoot of something that had real organic roots in the community. Absolutely. I mean, all everything you're saying existed. The Merle Sanders thing existed. I mean, Jerry Garcia. When I first met Jerry, he was a fine guitar player, man. Uh, but the the people who have subsequently deified Jerry uh, be, because of the band and the hippie experience probably wouldn't have listened to him originally mm-hmm. or cared that much about him because he was really interested in the music as opposed to this uh, crazy experiential soup uh, that became uh, the product. And so what, when you're talking about those Oakland black clubs and you're talking about cats, man, great cats, man, great players. Gaylord Birch. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, it's just it, it, to me, I'm like, put me back in that time. But it is humbling to know. Uh, and I, you're not the first person to say it. I mean, there were I've talked to guys from the loading zone like George Marsh and Paul Farso. They talk about playing, you know, what they thought was just a, the hottest first set, blew, blew it off the map. And they got no response from the crowd. They were all tripped out. They had no idea what was going on. It was they were there for the party, and they weren't that into the music yet. The musicians were there for the music, and that was the thing that was eye opening. The idea that Garcia, for instance, knew he had to, had to grow, and he chose to go in that direction to learn jazz chords and things like that. It was, sure. you know, it was it was, um, you know, taught when you um, when you got uh, you, but you so you went out to to. San Francisco, uh, I, I didn't realize you dropped out of college. I thought I read somewhere that you finished, you got a literature degree of some sort, but that... You, you oh, know. no, I, I, I eventually, it took me a little over six years to get a bachelor's degree. I eventually went to England and got a, a PhD degree in American Studies, History and Sociology, but this was in the 60s when I had no idea what next week would bring, let alone next year, and I was just kind of living on my wits. And I, like I say, I followed a girlfriend out out there, and I decided I was going to live there, and there, and there I was. Uh, by 1966, I had gone back to school to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Steve had dropped out. Uh, Miller had dropped out. He had spent some time in Chicago uh, on the blues scene, went home to Dallas, got his stuff together, moved out to San Francisco. And he called me up. He said, look, man, most of these kids out here, because the scene was just starting, you know, the Ken Kesey uh, acid test stuff. And he was saying, you know, everybody's putting bands together out here, and most of these guys can't play. And <laughs> Steve is a serious player. Bob's a serious player. I was a serious player. We could play. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that hippie thing, you know, it, it, most of the kids couldn't play, as I was saying. You know, they got into the music from some weird side door, not as musicians generally, but as people who wanted you know, to make the party happen. And so Steve said, man, you've got to come out here, man. It, it's just, you know, and Steve was one of the cats who could really play out there, and there were a bunch of them. But um, it was not necessarily typical. Uh, and as I say, the Chicago thing eventually really took over. Bill Graham uh, was a student of Mike Bloomfield's, you know, and uh-huh. so that's why all the Chicago blues guys wound up out there. And that's why the Chicago blues guys, I mean, eventually played on the stage with the light shows. But I can tell you mm-hmm. that Muddy Waters uh, or, uh, you know, Otis Rush, when they were standing on the stage at Fillmore, were probably incredulous 
as opposed to comfortable as they had been, you know, back in Chicago in the clubs. That was not a natural progression for them. Um, so when I say that that it uprooted the the regional music, remember the music came from a real experience, a Tuesday night on a side street in Chicago, you know, when somebody just fell into the club and there was a band on stage playing. That's the experience. That's the real experience. That's why when you talk about experiential learning and emotional learning, you know, that takes place on a Tuesday night on a side street somewhere where you walk into the club and it's late and they're, bar- they're closing up the bar and there's a cat down there at the end of the bar trying to get paid. And you watch him. He's got his horns. It's his old lady sitting at a table and she just wants to go. And he's trying to get his money from the bartender. And the bartender, you know, is, is, is playing with him. And he's counting out these soggy pieces of paper that are $20 bills and $1 bills. And he doesn't quite have the money he owes the cat, and he has to go in the back room, and now nobody's there. You know what I'm saying. This story goes on and on and on and on. That's that's where the music comes oh, from. Oh, man. I'm having a ball with Ben Sidron. We got another uh, another track of music, uh, you know, and then we'll come back and, and we'll go through it, okay? Great. about living in the U.S. of A. You know that I'm a gangster of love. Let me tell you people, I found a new way and I'm tired of all this talk about love. Well, it's the same, same old story with the news and the words about the good and the bad and the poor. The times keep on changing so I'm keeping on top of every bad cat that walks through my door. I'm a space I bet you weren't ready for that I'm a space cowboy I bet you didn't think I'd be back You didn't think I'd be back No, no, you didn't think I'd be back Did you? I didn't In the military shirts Well, I keep my eyes on the prize On the long falling skies I don't let my friends get hurt <laughs> All you back room Schemers, you power trip Dreamers better find something new to say Cause it's the same old story With a new set of words You got to never do is to play Yeah, I'm a space cowboy I bet you weren't ready for that Live show from uh, the Ordway Theater, St. Paul, Minnesota, 1986. Space Cowboy. But that song, the genesis of that song, you played a major role in putting that together. And um, why don't you take us through that a little bit? I mean, how did that even come about? Because those lyrics hold up as well today as they did then. Well, that version uh, was just kind of... uh uh, uh, something we uh, put together for that gig. Uh, uh, the original song was built on the same boogie woogie pattern that uh, the Beatles' "Lady Madonna" was based on, and uh, I think it was '69 or 1970, something like Brave that. Brave New World '69. That's right. There it is. Yep. Brave New World. Steve and I, uh, we were, I guess, in Los Angeles making this record with the Steve Miller Band, and there was this track. This rhythm track that went bum 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 dun 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 ba da dum bum ba da dun right, and we were sitting in a hotel room talking about, you know, how cool it would be to make a record that had a theme, a futuristic theme, you know, brave new world, uh, and so 
we went to write lyrics. I mean, we had this track, and we were sitting up in the hotel room. And <laughs> I literally said, well, listen, man, the, the track has got this Lady Madonna vibe to it. And, and, and uh, the Beatles had just come out with the song Looking Through a, a Glass Onion. I told you about li- uh, living in strawberry fields. You know, sure. uh, I told you about Strawberry Fields, the place where nothing is real. So I said, why don't we say, I told you about living in the USA, which was Steve's previous record, and you know I'm the gangster of love because he had cut the Johnny Guitar Watson tune. And I just started free-forming all those lyrics. Let me tell you, people, I found a new way. I'm tired of all this. You know, we're hanging out. And we got to the end of the verse, which Steve said, because I'm a space cowboy. I bet you weren't ready for that. And I said, holy mackerel. <laughs> you just put a bow on that one. He just, he just put a bow on it, man. So the original version of Space Cowboy uh, was uh, written in 25 minutes in a hotel room. Uh, that version you've got there was kind of like a, a kind of stretched out 80s jazz uh, version of what the song could be, because by then we were having fun playing that kind of music. So we just did that to it for that night. You know, yeah, it seems like there were just some kind of lyrics about, you know, uh, power trippers and 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 those things were still you know it's, it's funny because there was like that incubative scene over that you know like steve that was right around the time you were down in la making the album but um you were speaking about i mean what was the music industry like at that time uh for you to make kind of to in order to say those kinds of lyrics and paint those kinds of pictures because it's not that far off from where we are today yeah, well, it wasn't. It wasn't the, at that point, you know. Uh, we were talking about uh, Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam, and and we were talking about uh, a whole different set of power trip experiences. I mean, it wasn't until later that the record business turned into the opposition. Uh, at that time, the record business pretty much left us alone. That's right. Mm-hmm. They didn't know. They really didn't know what we were doing, and so they knew kids were buying it. And they didn't know how we were doing it, so they just sort of left us alone to do it. Um, but it was the rest of society. It's, you know, Stephen Stills and something going on over here. It, it it was all that, man. And it was the riots, and it was the murder of, uh, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. And and it was all this the darkness that had showed up that... Uh, that we were writing about the um could you explain like for instance when space cowboy came out i mean i I have the record and there's copies all over tucson but uh how would that get disseminated to different parts of the country i mean it would take a little bit of time for stuff to get to the east coast or the midwest how did it all work and how did it get on to am radio per se oh well see uh, by 69 um you know, you had you you had some serious successes. I mean, starting with uh, Dylan, who was distributed by uh, CBS, and uh, you know, Butterfield sold a bunch of records, and uh, of course, you had the British Invasion. You had all that rock and roll. Uh, most, uh, almost all records then were distributed through so-called independent distributors, and that means that around the country there were maybe ten, twelve different territories. Let's say there's a, a, where you are in, in Arizona. There's probably a territory that covered Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, I don't know if it'd be attached to California or not, but there'd be a, a company that uh, would work uh, in the case of Space Cowboy or Brave New World. That was a Capitol record. They would handle all of Capitol records. And so they would handle a brand-new Frank Sinatra record just like they would handle the Steve Miller record. And they would send a salesman out into the record stores to talk to the owner of the store and they'd say look I, these, these are the new records that are coming out here's an advanced copy how many do you want to order and that would be going on around the country so uh, the major companies and back then it was mostly major companies were pretty efficient I mean a, a record like uh, Steve Miller's first of all by then Rolling Stone existed uh, Crawdaddy existed there'd be articles you know in the under- so-called underground press and then Billboard magazine would trace what was shipped and it would show up on the chart uh, the major labels uh, employed uh, promotion guys who would go to the radio station and give the program director or the DJ what they used to call the $50 handshake <laughs> you know and uh, stuff would get played and it was pretty efficient by then um 
in in England, when you went over there, you obviously were studying uh, and writing. But did you you gigged a lot over there too? Well, I gigged some. I, I did uh, mostly uh, recording studio stuff because in, in uh, '67. Uh, the Steve Miller Band came from San Francisco to, to London to make the first record, Children of the Future. And I was living in Brighton, which is like an hour train ride south of London. I was going to the University of Sussex there. And so I would go to the university during the day, and at night I'd jump on a train and go up to London. And, of course, back then, you know, everybody was recording at night. Nobody would go on during the day. You'd go into the studio at 6, 7 o'clock at night and stay there till the sun came up. So I would go in there and... Uh, and hang with the band and work on the record. And then the band went back to San Francisco. But I was still in England for two more years. So through that experience, I had met producers and engineers at the studios in England. And, and I would play on recording sessions, and I would hang with those guys. And I was a full-time graduate student, but uh, I, was, I was working. How do you feel about... Um... I mean, do you do do you do mentor do you mentor a lot of, of younger cats today, or do you do the best you can to try to? And what do you? It's just so I want to say, what do you say to them? Because my generation grew up with people giving us instructions about how things are done, and there's templates, and there's Pat Martino books now, and and Elvin, yeah. and Elvin Jones drumming styles, you know. Follow, and right. so it's follow the leader. But before it was like, no, we're gonna we're gonna follow this path of the unknown. There are no street signs in the in the jungle is or in the swamps, as Doctor John said. And yep. uh, nowadays, you can't even follow the street signs that are on the street. So, what do you yep. what do you say to younger cats who have the soul and they have the gumption, and and they're living through this this t- time in our history? You know, that's a profound question, man, because it's it's really at the root of popular culture. Uh, when popular culture, uh, as it is today, exists everywhere and nowhere, you know, I mean, the internet it doesn't it doesn't it. It's nowhere, mm-hmm. and yet it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. It, it makes everybody rootless. It takes away the sense of place and regionalism and hometowns and all that stuff. And at the same time, everything's available. So when I started out, if you wanted to play piano like Horace Silver, you had to listen to a Horace Silver record 150 times to figure something out. But today, it's all in books. So all I have to do is go memorize it, or you go to school. I mean, when when I was in college... I probably would have taken a jazz course if there was one, but they wouldn't teach jazz anywhere. Jazz was like, I mean, if you were a jazz musician, uh, you would never play in a theater, but if you did, they wouldn't let you to play the same piano that the classical guys played. Wow. For, for wow. fear that jazz music, you know, seriously. No, so, I believe you, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it was the difference between learning a language on the street and learning it out of a textbook. So what we learned was was idiomatic. We learned the way it was spoken on the streets. And if we loved a particular guy, like my guy was Bud Powell or Sonny Clark or whatever, I would just listen to him and want to sound like him, and that was my favorite. And, of course, I would fail because you can't sound like anybody but yourself. But then you'd recover from that failure. Once you realized that you had failed and you stopped and you thought you'd work in a hardware store, but you had to come back, in, in that recovery was the seeds of where your career and your style lives, man. Everybody has to fail before they can succeed. Today, it's a whole different uh, set of uh, ladders that you climb, as you said. You know, there are templates. Uh, They won't let you fail. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, in some (laughs) ways... I never thought about that, but that's true. You know, if you're in a class, Mm -hmm. they won't let you fail, man. You know, if you're not doing well... You know, you can stay after school, man, and, and practice these uh, these scales. And uh, so everybody can be successful, but nobody sounds like themselves because they haven't recovered from a personal failure. Wow. This is, oh my gosh. We got uh, another track off your latest album, uh, and uh, then we're going to dissect that. So we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. Don't cry for no hipster He knew what he signed up for But look on the field 
that run-down appeal The passing ship, the distant shore Now don't cry for no hipster He saw the writing on the wall And it gives him hope Just another slippery slope A deeper truth he can't recall And when young becomes old turns to cold and that's when we'll see if the truth set him free until then don't cry for no hipster he had his day he had his night Let's call it what it is In a life like his It's usually wrongs that make it right Make it right, isn't that what we we're just talking about? You gotta, yeah, that's it. Yeah, right. You gotta, you, you gotta actually fall down, and and or as Pat, Pat, Pat Martino told me, you reach the bottom of the pit, and then it's all the way up from there. But you know, in, right. in your own words, uh, Ben, um, what a classic name of a song, and props to my engineer Jim Blackwood for pulling that down. But um, talk, talk about the meaning of that song because it, you know it, it, it is. Uh, it's relevant to now, and, and it's relevant to spirits long gone. Yeah. Well, it is. There's something uh, tragic and universally American about the, the hipster image. Uh, tragic in the sense that it's, like everything else in America, 100 years later turned into a fashion statement and something that we're trying to monetize. But originally, it was pure, prototypically American, this idea of somebody living outside the system and at the same time commenting on the system and having his own way of dressing and talking and walking. And in this particular case, the whole thing was premised on jazz and the, and the music and the life of the jazz musician, which is what the hip culture was originally back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, it was, it was cross-referenced with bohemianism. It was cross referenced uh, with art and literature. It was cross-referenced with humor, comedy, Lenny Bruce, Lord Buckley. It was cross-referenced with uh, uh, Mort Sahl, politics. Um, the, the idea of the hipster as an American archetype uh, was very important. Um, it's what Norman Mailer called the white Negro. And uh, this synthesis of uh, elements that created such a rich, popular culture in America, you know, like so much, is uh, no longer uh, available because the underlying conditions that that it lived in are no longer here. I mean, these are real living things, these cultural things. And when the, when the ecological conditions aren't right, they, do, they go away. And you can't bring them back uh, with desire. They come when they come, and they go when they go. But... Uh, the lyric, don't cry for no hipster, he knew what he signed up for. Uh, when I was 13 or 14 years old, if you told me that I could uh, wind up playing piano and hanging out with Horace Silver and jazz musicians and cats and 
that there'd be some rough times and some unknown times, and I would have taken that deal in a heartbeat, man. I knew what I signed up for. Uh, I saw the writing on a wall, and it gave me hope. But it, <laughs> it was another slippery slope, and it was a deeper truth I couldn't recall. So those lyrics are literally written about my experience. I I, I wonder also. I mean, I I opened up my monologue about people creating their own history, and I, I you know we know what the classic term of hipster is, or at least you know among the youth today. I I wonder. Um, it seems going back to the. Um, melodic invention of guys like Blue Mitchell, Tony Williams, uh, telling their their stories uh, through these grooves. Um, I think you guys, uh, Miller, Skaggs, Elvin Bishop, uh, yourself, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, you guys were a little more in touch with reality and history than we are today. I mean, we are all living in our own little bubbles, even now as I talk to you. Um, yes. it, it, it's not as easy to be able to, I mean, the ability for you to be so flexible to go back and forth, go to San Francisco, back to Sussex, then back to, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it seems like, uh, I agree with you ecologically, the time's not correct, but almost back then through those, that visceral playing of music, you knew your history more, you knew what was real, what was not. Whereas today, you know, with the saturation of information and the fact that, uh, and values. I think values have collapsed as well. I mean, I think that's the reality as well. And I just wanted to get your thoughts with this new book that you wrote. Uh, what 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 are you trying to capture with this new book as well? Yeah, well, you said it. Uh, you said it, man. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I, that's really? It. I said it? I mean, I don't know you about said, it. <laughs> the, the thing about the book uh, uh, that gives hope, in fact, is the title. There was a fire, and it comes from a story about hundreds of years ago, back in Eastern Europe, you know, in a, in a Jewish shtetl with these poor huddled Jews who weren't allowed to participate in society. You know, the Pale of Settlement was an enormous uh, reservation that the Jews were placed on. Jews weren't allowed in the cities of Russia or Poland. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to have companies. They weren't allowed to own land, um, and they were held in this area that is now Poland, Lithuania, Latvia. There were millions of Jews there. And uh, so there's a story about uh, this rabbi. And the rabbi was called the Baal Shem Tov, and his community was in trouble, and so he went into the woods and he lit a special fire at a special place and said a special prayer, and his community was saved. And then the next generation, the community was in trouble again, and so that rabbi went into the woods, he went to the special place, lit the special fire, but he didn't know how to say the special prayer, and he said, well, maybe it's, uh, it's enough, and it was, and the community was saved. And for the next generation, now we're two generations away from the original moment, the community's in trouble again, the rabbi goes in the woods, now he doesn't know the prayer, now he doesn't know how to make the special fire, he knows the place, Maybe this is uh, sufficient, and it was, and the community was saved. Finally, finally, <laughs> the community's in trouble. Four generations later, the rabbi goes in the woods. He doesn't know the place. He doesn't know the prayer. He doesn't know how to make the fire. But he says, maybe just the memory that there was a fire will be sufficient. And it was, and the community was saved. So my book is about memory. It's about, I wanted to remember something. I wanted to write it down. Because once it's written, you can agree with it, you can disagree with it, you can like it, or you can hate it. But... History is written by the survivors, and I felt that since I got to this ripe old age and had been through what I've been through, it was my uh, job, my obligation, and my pleasure to remember what I wanted to have remembered. And so that's that, to me, is the good news, man. We can remember. We can always remember. And just the act of memory, like you're talking about, you're obviously caught up in the memory of the way it was, and why was it that way, and was it really like that? And there's something that's changing you. You're being transformed by this memory. It's, it's, dri it's driving you to be who you are. It's transformative. Memory is transformative. And uh, memory, of course, has been the essential driving force of the Jewish culture for 3,000 years. Remember, you were the one who was freed in Egypt. Remember right? When Abraham spoke to God, you spoke to God. That was you there. Uh, and so it's a very Jewish thing, and it's something that Americans aren't very good at. We don't remember very well. We don't remember 
heck, we don't even remember uh, the fact that uh, we're running out of oil. <laughs> well, I mean, just like, you know, one, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, that yeah, used yeah. to be true. I don't know if it is. I, I think it, memory, yeah, memory is because I was there, but um, also uh, a fan, it's a fantasy, too. Um, and that is yeah. the, the most scintillating um, part about it. I, ben, um, I just uh, I'm going to say goodbye, but if you can hang on the phone afterwards for a minute, I just want to have a couple. I have a couple things I wanted to talk to you about. So, sure, okay. go ahead. Uh, ben Sidron, uh, Happy New Year again, and and uh, the the book is the book is out now. The name of the book? Can you t- say the name of the book again? The book is called "There Was a Fire: Jews, Music, and the American Dream." You can get it all over the internet. You can get it at Amazon. I prefer you go to bensidron.com because that way you'll see all the other stuff that's going on. A true American success story, and we got a lot more to talk about, but for now, that'll do. Ben Sidron, thank you so much for being part of the program. You're welcome, Jake. Thank you. This is Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you all in a little bit.